I look for a severe recession in the U.S., um, really global, because you, you know, your question was, how's the global outlook? It's pretty bad. Um, maybe something closer to you know, social unrest and riots in Europe. Um, and then on top of that, possibly a global financial liquidity crisis worse than 2008. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. The global economy is stumbling, and not just for financial reasons like the increasing cost of debt. Supply chains remain compromised. We're still having material challenges in both producing and distributing real physical goods across our oceans and continents. This is such a serious threat to global prosperity that best-selling author James Rickards has made it the focus of his new book, Sold Out. How Broken Supply Chains, Surging Inflation, and Political Instability Will Sink the Global Economy. What are the biggest looming risks we need to be aware of? And what steps should we, as both consumers and investors, take? For answers, we sit down now with James Rickards himself. Jim, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Adam. It's great to be with you. Thanks. Look, Jim, I got a ton of questions about this great new book of yours. Real quick, though, let me just toss out the normal starting question I, I like to begin these discussions with. What's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Sure. The, the global economy is weakening very quickly. Um, that's backed up by a lot of metrics. Uh, most recent data out of, out of China indicates they're on the brink of a recession, if not in a recession, which is kind of shocking considering this is an economy that grew at 10% compound rate for about 30 years. Uh, then that sort of you know, 7% became the new 10%, and then 5% became the new 7%, but now they're, they're close to zero. Uh, they lie about their numbers. They're, they're not reliable, but you know you can, you can uh, get something out of it. There are other you know, private sources of information that uh, show the same thing. So their growth is close, close to zero. A lot of reasons for it, you know, the real estate meltdown, the COVID lockdowns, which are you know, probably as much political as they are medical. There's no medical sense to them whatsoever. You should just, you know, let people get herd immunity. That's how Europe and the United States got past uh, the pandemic, but China has not. Uh, but but they're continuing to do that, um, you know, decoupling from the United States, demographic implosion. So China's a mess. Europe's not much better. Um, they're, again, right on the border of a recession right now, uh, according to a lot of data, but they're going to take a, a deep plunge almost uh, immediately as the, uh, I guess they've had a little bit of a mild spell in Europe, but the cold weather won't be far behind. I actually watched the uh, the jet stream. Uh, you know, often the jet stream is kind of straight with a little bit of a wave, but every now and then it goes uh, meridian on which which means it's really wobbly. Uh, that means that's how these cold Arctic blasts come down into, you know, it could be the United States, North America or Europe. It, it looks like that's how the jet stream shaping up. So you look for a bitterly cold winter in Europe. Uh, <clears throat> their energy is depleted. You know, you hear the happy talk from the EU leadership and others, you know, well, Germany's reserves are uh, almost 100 percent full. Yeah, but the, what they don't tell you is that the reserves are only 20% of what they need. So you got 100% of 20%, which is 20%, at least where I went to school. No new supply coming in. Uh, latest information, I had always pointed to the U.S. as being behind the sabotage of the Nord Stream pipeline. But when I say U.S., I kind of put U.K. in the same breath because they, they work together. The latest information is that it was actually a U.K. operation, obviously with the blessing and the support of the United States. Just gave us a little bit of plausible deniability, but not much because the UK, as I say, they would they wouldn't have done it without clearing it with us. Um, so, uh, but that what that does, it takes away Germany's options. You know, if Germany decided they wanted to, you know, make amends with Putin or at least talk to Putin, get the natural gas flowing in exchange for easing up on arms shipments to Ukraine, et cetera, that that door was open, but not anymore because uh, they took away Putin's leverage because. Even if Putin said, yeah, I'll give you more gas, he can't do it, at least in the short run, because the pipeline's blown up. So that was that was almost like the U.S. declaring war on Germany. I mean, something we've done before a couple of times, but uh, that's that's just sinking in. But, but, you know, people talk about liquid natural gas it was a big... Uh, uh, a big story oh, a few weeks ago, well, <clears throat> that the European Union had signed a major na uh, liquid natural gas deal with Gutter, you know, which is a major producer. So I looked into it and it's like, yeah, uh, it'll come online in 2026. Uh, basically, the Qataris, who are no dopes, were getting the Europeans to fund 
the build out of the infrastructure in a new gas field in the northern part of Qatar, which is, you know, peninsula. Um, yeah, so 2026, well, good luck getting from here to there. That sounds like four years away. Uh, they're not, they're not going to make it through four months. And that's the point. Um, you know, they got some floating barges to offtake LNG, but it, the capacity is not there. The LNG is not available. And by the way, what happens to, uh, I live in New England, what happens to New England natural gas prices if Biden starts shipping our natural gas to Europe? Um, nothing good, I can tell you. So, uh, so Europe is, um, and this is uh, more than just a slowdown, more than just an economic headwind. This is you're looking at something more like a catastrophe. I mean, Germany is the fourth largest economy in the world, or has been. It might actually be the third largest right now. There's so some recent data that they might have passed Japan, but they they have the highest ratio of net exports to GDP. You know, GDP is a number of components. U.S. is very consumption driven. China is very investment driven. Uh, Germany is very export driven. So what do they make? You know, uh, watches, uh, cars, uh, precision machinery, uh, you know, aircraft, uh, all, all sorts of high tech things. Siemens, you know, Volkswagen. Look at the, the BASF, the big companies there. Um, they're going to. They are. They are already starting to shut down manufacturing lines, but this is going to get a lot worse. The energy is going to be rationed. People, uh, thermostats are going to be set at you know 50 degrees fahrenheit i mean i'm, I'm not sure what the equivalent is in, in centigrade about 15 or something but um they're going to be uh you know the germans are out chopping down trees to get wood to stay warm this winter uh there is no firewood for sale uh this isn't medieval this is neolithic um and then you know the poles are lined up to get get coal depots to get some coal in the trunks of their cars or the flatbeds of their pickup trucks for the same reason. So this is a disaster. Now, over the United States, um, our economy, you know, so we had negative growth in the first quarter and the second quarter of 2022, two back-to-back -back quarters of declining GDP meets the kind of rule of thumb definition of a recession. Nobody wants to use the R word. They're, they're all hiding behind the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is the unofficial official arbiter of recessions and recoveries. We'll see what they say. Typically, the, the National Bureau of Economic Research declares a recession, the beginning of recession, after it's already over. It's like, thanks, we've been through it. Thanks for letting us know we just had a recession. They'll probably come out and say something next year, who knows. But, um, but if it was a recession, it, it, it kind of looks like one. It was very mild, granted. Growth in the third quarter was a lot stronger, 2.6%. But when you dissect that, what you see is that um, that was almost 100% driven by net exports. When, when was the last time the United States had positive GDP driven by net exports? Probably 1959. I mean, that's we're 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 that's typically a drag on growth, and we we run a, been running trade deficits forever. Uh, but there it was. Um, that meant that people were still buying U.S. goods, but the U.S. we were not buying as much from other people. That's ind indicative of a slowdown. Consumption was weak. Private investment was weak. Inventories were weak. Those are the real drivers of the economy, and they were all weak. So, okay, net exports, that's not sustainable. So I would look for a recession, a more severe recession to begin in the fourth quarter. That's one, you know, combined with Fed tightening, interest rate hikes, um, balance sheet reductions, et cetera. That's one whole vector, and I wouldn't put any weight on a low unemployment rate. It ignores labor force participation rate, which is awful. You know, it's down around 62% versus 70% in the year 2000. But um, but beyond that, unemployment is a lagging indicator. Unemployment goes up after a recession begins. Employers are very reluctant to lay off employees. You got to pay severance. Um, you, it, it's expensive to recruit and hire them back and train them. So you, you, you pretty much wait until the recession has already started. And you can, oh, gee, all right, I got to lay some people off. So it's not a leading indicator. It's a lagging indicator. So the Fed is behind the curve. Um, and then... And then beyond all that, Adam, is the, the biggest, you know, the, the real, um, you know, 500 pound gorilla in the room, if you want to call it that, is um, there is a brewing global liquidity crisis, a global financial crisis. <coughs> Pardon me, that's that's different from a recession. It's uh, financial panics and recessions are two different things. They can come separately. In 1998, we had a financial panic, but there was no recession. In 1990, we had a recession, but there was no financial panic. In 2008, we had both. They, they can come together. It looks like they might be coming together again. This is revealed in uh, inverted yield curves. Um, uh, major dealers are bidding at auction for treasury bills 
the Fed will give you treasury bills for the phone call. All you have to do is call the Fed and do a reverse, reverse repo with the Fed. They'll give you some treasury bills. But the banks are bidding at auction for treasury bills that yields to maturity lower than what the Fed will give you for a phone call. Why would you do that? The answer is the Fed bills um, cannot be rehypothecated. They cannot be used as collateral, but the auction bills can. So what that tells you is there's a collateral shortage. That means deleveraging balance sheets. It means financial distress. And we also see it uh, not just in the treasury yield curve, which is inverted from uh, right now, um, six months to 10 years, but also the euro dollar futures curve, which is even more troubling. It's not unprecedented, but it is rare and it's not a good sign. But the Fed continues, you know, raising rates in the, in the teeth of this really bad data. So I look for a severe recession in the U.S., um, really global, because, you, you know, your question was, how's the global outlook? It's pretty bad. Um, maybe something closer to, you know, social unrest and riots in Europe. Um, and then on top of that, possibly a global financial liquidity crisis worse than 2008. Okay, so uh, you just gave an interview's worth of answers in that first question, <laughs> Jim. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, my challenge is, is there's so many threads I want to pull on there, um, but I want to I, I want to you know go towards the the very sort of at least initially supply side uh, viewpoint of, of the book you just came out with. Um, I want to put it a pin in a couple of things there. Um, Real quick, I just want to ask one question based on what you said, because I would really love your, your feedback on it. Um, when you were talking about the U.S., you talked about the low labor force partic participation rate that we have here. And um, I think you said it was like around 62 percent. And I'm just curious, like what 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 really is driving that? Um, we, we, we seem to have a huge chunk of our working age population that is not working. And you probably study this more than most people. Like, what's what's truly going on there? Um, do we have a? Uh, is is it just an aging population that truly can't work? Um, I know that disability has been a has seen massive growth over the past like fifteen years. Um, you know, are there a bunch of people that are opting out or gaming the system or whatever? But what's responsible for us only having sixty two percent of our working age population actually engaged in working? Well. There are two answers to that, and but they're consistent. I'll give you both. The short answer is it doesn't matter. And now you, you you listen to a number of factors. I'll go back over those factors, and you're, you're right. But it doesn't matter. It, it low is low. In other words, the the thing about labor force participation is a very simple calculation. You you say how many people are working. That's the the, the numerator, and how big is the labor force? That's the denominator. That's all it is. Now it's never a hundred percent, right? Because there are students and homemakers and retirees and others. There are good reasons for some people not to be in the workforce at any given time. But as recently as 2000, that number was 70%. What drove it between 19, about approximately 1975 and 2000 was basically women entering the workforce, women who had been home, um, you know, as homemakers or uh, you know, performing other roles, entered the workforce, and then that number went up. So it, like I guess it's never 100, but 70 was very strong. 62 is, is down a lot. I mean, that's... Um, about a 14% decline. Um, look, you know, GDP, the standard definition is, um, you know, it's consumption plus investment plus net exports plus, you know, government expenditure, like a four part thing. Yeah, but there's a simpler way to do it, which is how many people are working, how productive are they? Just who's working and how productive are they? That, that equals nominal GDP. Um, and if you have fewer people working, there's the, the economy is going to shrink unless productivity is going up, which it's not. Uh, and so this is one of the major headwinds. Now, you're right. There are some early retirees. Um, there were a lot of people who stayed home, obviously, during COVID. And just it, it's very well studied and clear that um, working is a habit, you know, it's a good habit, I think, for the most part. But it's like any habit. Once you break it, it's hard to go back. So once you get used to not working, or working from home or, you know, we're just staying home. Um, the government was handing out checks, you know, beginning with Trump in, uh, I believe it was June 2020. Everybody got a, uh, that one was a $1,400 check. And then in December 2020, at the end of the Trump administration, everybody got a $600 check. 
and Biden comes in in February 2021, not to be outdone, he hands out, uh, I think, a $1,600 check. Um, so everybody got a check, like two or three of them. And uh, a lot of younger people uh, opened accounts on Robinhood and started trading Bitcoin. That didn't work out too well. But um, but a lot of people saved the money. But but there was a very there were de- very definite spikes in retail sales coming within 30 days of the checks. Well, that's not surprising. I give people free money, they'll go buy stuff. And that kind of kept the economy going. It wasn't a real boom, but it, yeah, it, 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 um, it looked good, but we're not doing that anymore. There's no more checks. Uh, and so you had a lot of people lost the habit, a lot of people staying home, watching, you know, maybe uh, the World Series or whatever, eating Doritos, but they're not working. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, a lot of people out of the habit, but they just got used to government handouts. Not everybody, but but some. And um, the other problem is, uh, you know, because people say, wait a second, how can you have low labor force participation when everywhere you look, they're help on the signs, which there are. I mean, I was, right. you know, McDonald's is paying a thirty-five thousand dollar for an entry level like cashier or hamburger, um, you know, maker uh, with benefits, training, and advancement. Well, that's pretty good for you know a entry level hamburger person. Um, so there are la- the, and people call this a labor shortage. There isn't actually a labor shortage because we just talked about how you've got perhaps as many as 10 million you know, people between the ages of 25, 54 who are sitting home. But the problem from the employer's point of view, there's a shortage of willing workers. Not, willing workers, yeah. Not workers, but willing workers. Well, what makes you willing to work? Well, a, a raise, <laughs> a good pay is, is one. And those employers can't afford to pay the clearing wage to get people off the couch because they'll go bankrupt themselves. They're working on very small margins you know, sales are declining, et cetera. So I'll pay as much as I can to get the workers, but it's not enough to get this person off the couch, so to speak. And so you've got this really weird situation. I use weird in the, in the technical sense where you have a huge pool of able-bodied, you know, potential workers, but a shortage of willing workers because you can't pay a clearing wage. But that's more a reflection of uh, how stressed businesses and how low margins are. And then you look at the big names. I mean, um, I guess Twitter is the most recent, but uh, you know, Amazon, FedEx, um, you know, Target, uh, they're all looking at, at big layoffs and big, layoffs, big, yeah. big layoff announcements coming every day. So um, not, none of which is good for, uh, for the U S economy, but um, I, you know, the fed looks at unemployment. I mean, I look at it cause you're supposed to know what it is. I mean, uh, I would say, if, you, if you're trying to forecast the Fed, you got to look at the world the way they do, even if it's messed up. Like even if they're looking at the wrong things, which they are, as an analyst, you have to look at them to figure out what they're doing. That's that's how you do intelligence work. Think like the other guy. But then once I take my Fed hat off and say, well, what do I think? Um, the, the unemployment rate is almost irrelevant. First, that's a lagging indicator. Secondly, it ignores what we talked about with labor force participation. There is no Phillips curve. I mean, you can draw one. Last time I saw Phillips curve was flat. Well, where I went to school, curves weren't flat. But that's uh, but they're, they're just looking at the wrong indicators. Okay. All right. Well, th- th- thanks for going through that with me because I, I do worry that um, you know there's there's something not good um, a- a- about such a low participa- uh, labor force participation rate um, from a from an economic standpoint, right? Like we're not being as productive as we could be as a society, and there's something not good societally about it where you get a smaller and smaller group that is doing all the caring, all the water caring for society, and you begin to get you know animosity growing there. Um, so anyways, I'm curious, do you, do you, we're in this weird time, do you think, is basically a painful recession going to be what sort of cures it, which is it evaporates the excess job openings, the people on the couch finally just run out of, of means as long as there's still no government checks going to them. And eventually they have to say, hey, if I want to afford Doritos, I got to go get a job. I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, because, uh, uh, I don't know if the, what the recession is the cure for. It's coming. I mean, the yeah, recession is coming, but who, um, and, and Jay Powell said this. I mean, Jay Powell gave two speeches, August 26th at uh, Jackson Hole and September 21st after a press conference after the FOMC meeting that day. Uh, and the September 21st speech was almost like, well, just in case you weren't listening to me in Jackson Hole, let me tell you again what's happening. And he was in Jackson Hole. He was like, Nancy Pelosi, he tore up a speech and wrote a new one, like literally the day before. Yep. It was three or four pages. It was really short. Uh, he used the word pain three times in one paragraph. I've been following Fed 
news for 45 years. I've never seen the word pain ever. Right. That he was pretty amazing. Times. But he said, but he basically said the same thing. But September 21st, he was even more blunt. He said, there's going to be a recession. It's going to be bad. Uh, unemployment is going to go up. Get it, you know, get it straight. These things are going to happen. And that's what it's going to take to get inflation under control. But he went on and on about how inflation was job one, uh, because the Fed has this dual mandate, which never made sense, but it's the law. I mean, Humphrey Hawkins. So um, the dual mandate is price stability and low unemployment. Okay. Those two things don't always go together. And sometimes you got to make trade-offs between the two. But right now, the trade-off is very easy, which is unemployment's really low. Now, I don't put much weight on it, but the Fed does. Again, put your Fed hat on. Unemployment's really low. If unemployment went from three point, I think it's at 3.5, 3.6 at the moment. Um, if it went to four and a half, uh, 4.9, is that the end of the world? Well, that was considered pretty low in 2013 you know, when they were doing Q, QE4 or whatever, QE3. Right. So, um, so they're willing to do that. Um, and they also think the recession, if it comes, will be mild. Uh, and uh, But those two things together... <laughs> will get inflation under control. <clears throat> and, right. and, he and by did, the way, they, they, they think the mild because they think they're going to engineer a soft landing, which I'm guessing you think the probability of a soft landing is pretty low. Close to zero. Um, the, uh, the, um, the, the thing about I mean, and what Powell said, he didn't say that, we're, I mean, their target is core PCE, you know, uh, personal consumption expenditure, price index core meaning excluding food and energy. And everyone's like, why would you exclude food and energy? Again, I'm not here to debate it. That's what they do. So yeah. if you want to think like a fed, fed head, that's what they do. Okay. They want to get core PCE year over year to 2%. It just came in at 5.2, which was up from August. The September was 5.2. August was about 4.7, give or take. <coughs> Pardon me. It just went up. I mean, it's not going down. So, um, so, but they're trying to get it down. Now, he, now Powell did not say, we're going to raise rates until core PC is 2%. He didn't say that. What he said was, we're going to raise rates until it's acting in a restrictive way on inflation and inflation will come down on its own because rates will be higher and high enough to cause that. Mm -hmm. At which point we will, we, the Fed will pause. And then you say, well, when are you going to cut rates? He was like, the, the pause could be a year. Right. So, so there, you're talking, tw forget this Fed pivot nonsense. I mean, you're talking 2024, if then, before they cut rates. But in the meantime, um, so they've got to get rates high enough. So they're going to go, you know, well, 75 basis points in November, December, who knows? We'll, we'll know closer to the date. It'll either be 50 or 75, you know, some talk about 50, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it, it, it's going up. Probably going to go up. You know, I have the calendar for 2023. There's a meeting February 1st and another one in uh, late March, I think March 22nd. They'll probably raise up both of those. They're going to get rates up to five, five-ish. Um, at that point, they probably will have achieved the goal of bringing core PCE down, but they will also have destroyed the economy in the process. It's like I remember in, in Vietnam, the old saying, you know, we had to, we had to destroy the village to save it. Yeah. Um, we have to destroy the economy to save it. This this is uh, the latest and long string of uh, Fed blunder since uh, 1913 seems to be their specialty, but that's what they're doing. Yeah. And you know what? Uh, and I do want to get to your book here in a minute. Um, but uh, right now, is there really much different the Fed could be doing? Yeah, they, they could uh, they could uh, at least pause now. Or maybe even cut rates. If 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 everything I said is correct, and obviously I think it is, or I wouldn't be saying it. But if we're on the verge of a global liquidity crisis, as revealed by the euro dollar futures curve and the treasury yield curve, and you know uh, negative swap spreads and uh, treasury bill auctions with the yield of maturity below what the Fed will give you for a phone call, I mean, all those things are happening. That's hard data, uh, and it's a very very. Uh, um, uh, troubling sign, last seen in 2008, by the way, before the two, before the Lehman Brothers meltdown. If all that's happening, and the fundamental signs are also weak, which we just saw in third quarter GDP, which is based on net exports, which won't last. How, how are you going to drive a trade surplus with with the strongest dollar in 20 years? Good luck with that. I mean, nobody can afford our stuff, and we're not buying anybody else's stuff. Right. Um, so, with the economy going into a recession on its own, with a global liquidity crisis brewing. Why on earth is the Fed raising rates at all? 
Okay. And so does that imply then if we just sort of let the system take care of itself, that CPI would get pulled down anyways sure, by yeah. this recession? Right. And that's that's a big part of my book. Um, you know, when I when I talked to my editor about this, you know, go back a year ago. So November, <clears throat> pardon me, November uh, 2021, you know, every headline you looked at, website, commentary, supply chain, supply chain, supply chain is breaking down. There's no uh, you know, uh, uh, they, they couldn't get cream cheese to make uh, make cheesecakes uh, at Junior's, you know, the world's world's most famous cheesecake place, um, you know, and on and on and on, like a, a long list. And then last spring was the, the baby formula shortage, which is actually was serious. I mean, mothers couldn't feed their children. So it was very bad. And I talked to my editor about the book. We said, OK, let's do it. Um, and of course, and so I've got three chapters. Uh, to start one on, uh, you know, just anecdotal stuff, kind of thing I just mentioned, how bad is it? Chapter two is why, what, what caused it? When did it start? And right, how we get I, here. Yeah. I found some, but I found some really, really interesting research that, because uh, everyone says, well, yeah, COVID messed it up and the war in Ukraine messed it up. Well, that's true, but it didn't start there. This started in 2018 with Trump's tariffs. Because when, and I, I'm not here to debate the tariffs. I actually think the tariffs were a good idea, but that was the start of the supply chain breakdown. Because when Trump put tariffs on, started with uh, appliances, you know, washing machines, refrigerators, and stuff, and then solar panels, and then, you know, technology, and then they just kept piling on. Okay. Well, and Chinese, sorry to interrupt, but, but, but did that mostly impact goods from China, those tariffs? Yes. Um, but, but you have to look at what China did in response. China, the U.S. and Brazil are the two largest exporters of soybeans. China is the world's largest importer of soybeans. Mm -hmm. China was buying all their soybeans from the United States just as a way to kind of make it make it up a little bit. Like, well, we don't want we got to buy the soybeans anyway. Why not buy them from the U.S. to keep the U.S. China trade deficit under control so it doesn't become too politically toxic? Um, well, as soon as we Trump threw on the tariffs, China retaliated by moving their soybean uh, orders to Brazil. Stop buying U.S. soybeans. Well, <laughs> that's not a phone call. I mean, you're talking about vessels, port facilities, uh, agriculture, you know, trucks. How do you get the soybeans to the ports? Uh, how many do you grow? Where's the fertilizer coming from? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And all those parties, you know, the shippers, the cargo, the insurance companies, and so many people involved, banks, letters of credit, it's just a lot involved. Um, they don't like short-term relationships. They say, okay, I'll do it. I want a five-year contract. And China said, Okay. So they reconfigured all those transportation lanes to get the soybeans from Brazil. All of a sudden, you're a U.S. soybean grower. You say, well, what do I do? Well, we start selling them to the Netherlands because the Netherlands needs soybeans too. So now, but now instead of shipping them from like Port of L.A. to Ningbo and near Shanghai, we're shipping them from Port of Houston to, I don't know, uh, France or Marseille or someplace uh, or, or Rotterdam. So the point being, um, you completely scrambled all these uh, supply chain relationship and they break down that it's not, it's not that it's the end of the supply chain. I actually start the book. I have an introduction uh, where I talk about a bronze age vessel, a wreck in a place called Ulu Barun, which is off the Southern coast of Turkey that was discovered by a sponge diver in the 1980s. And then it was, it was excavated. It was the most perfectly preserved bronze age cargo they've ever discovered, but what was in it. And I have the inventory list and a lot of research on it. There was uh, amber from uh, the vicinity of the Baltic Sea. There was gold, which came, at the time came from Sudan. There were swords, which at the time came from you know Damascus or, or you know present day uh, Israel and Lebanon. Um, you know there was oil from uh, from uh, olive oil from from Italy, etc. There was a carving for, of uh, Queen Nefertiti, which was bound for her in Alexandria, Egypt. The point being, uh, this vessel had a was doing a, a counterclockwise um, a circuit of the Mediterranean Sea, you know, based on the winds, picking up and dropping off cargo all along the way. But that supply chain, if you go from, you know, like Sw Sweden to Sudan, it's almost the Arctic Circle to the equator, and from present day Iran to Spain, that's 5 million square miles. So there's nothing new about supply chains. We can document to the Bronze Age. What was new beginning around 1989 was supply chain science. The combination of vastly improved computing power, artificial intelligence, new algorithms, and more sources of data that could be put together and used by experts to, to optimize and make the supply chains more efficient. That was new. And it kind of began with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union. And you know, Berlin Wall fell in 1989. 
Soviet Union uh, uh, dissolved uh, in 1991. I talked to the guy who, you know, like this is a worldwide endeavor, but he was probably the single most responsible individual for all the significant developments in the supply chain in the last 30 years. And he said to me, he said, Jim, you have to understand, it took us 30 years to build it. We blew it up in three years. It's not going to come back overnight. Mm-hmm. It's going to take 10 years or more to rebuild it. And what I talk about in the book is supply chain 1.0, which is 1989 to 2019, and then supply chain 2.0, which kind of starts now, but is going to go indefinitely because it's going to take a long time to put this together. It's uh, you know, it's like dropping a vase and it breaks in a, th- a thousand pieces. You can't put it back together. You got to go buy a new vase. And that's what's going on with the supply chain. There will be a supply chain. There always is. But the new supply chain will look very different from what we've just come through. Because the whole the whole 30 years of period I'm describing was built on efficiency. You know, lower cost, lower cost, lower cost. It was kind of the Walmart model. So, yeah, just-in-time inventory. Everyone knows about that. But there's something called cross-stocking. That's where a truck pulls up at a warehouse and you unload it. Instead of putting the stuff in the warehouse, you move it to another truck that then goes to a destination. The stuff never goes in the warehouse. Inventories are very expensive. They're they're they're, they're costly to finance. You got to move the stuff around. It's called picking. You know, pick the stuff off the shelf with your. I used to drive a forklift, so I know a little bit about it. Uh, you know, and put it on a truck. We used to unload trucks too. Um, but um, so so, you know, hey, I've got seven suppliers. Why don't I cut it down to three and do bigger contracts with each one and get lower unit costs? I've got five transportation lanes. Why don't I cut that down to two? get everything to you know, Los Angeles and Seattle, as the case may be, you know, et cetera. And they, they did it for three, and they got costs lower, you know, and, and Walmart and Amazon were the champions of this, but everyone else was doing it. But they missed something. What they missed was that they're, while they were getting those unit, unit costs lower for consumers, they, there were hidden costs. And the main hidden cost was you, you were creating greater frailty. This whole system was subject to a massive, massive breakdown. So, uh, you know, what happens if you have two suppliers and they both go on strike? What happens if you have one port of entry and it's backlogged? What happens if, um, uh, you, you know, you, you, you've you got uh, quest docking in warehouses and there aren't enough trucks? There's 80, there are 80,000, we need 80,000 drivers, 80,000 drivers. I wish they'd hire them instead of these IRS agents. But the point being, um, it, it is breaking down all across the board. Now, will it, it can it be put back together? Yes, but the biggest difference between 2.0 and 1.0, um, this goes by different names. Uh, you know, Johnny Yellen called it friendshoring, and Macron called it a constellation of nations. Uh, I I use the term a college of nations, you know, collegial club, if you will. So you'll still have trading partners, you'll still have outsourcing, you'll still have transportation lanes, but it'll be members only. It'll be basically democratic, kind of liberal republics, Western Europe. Uh, you know, the EU, of course, uh, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, uh, you know, and, and some others, India, we expect to be included, fr- friendly nations, but China's out. We're decoupling from them. They're decoupling from us. This isn't US driven. The US is participating, but this is what China wants too. Both sides are decoupling as fast as they can. China can develop its own network, you know, maybe Central Asian Republic, some Southeast Asian. Um, you know, suppliers and so forth, but they're going to lose customers. Well, most of their customers actually in, in the United States, we won't buy their stuff and we won't sell them our stuff, particularly high tech stuff. So you, the world's going to break and, and these new clubs are going to be formed and there will be trade and there will be transportation lanes, but it'll be much more restrictive. Now, will prices be a little higher? Yes, but it'll be more secure. So the way I describe that you know, if you buy uh, insurance on your house or I buy insurance on my house, you don't want your house to burn down. You hope it doesn't. But if it does, you don't think your insurance premiums are a waste of money. Like when you write that check, you're like, that's money well spent. When you pay higher prices for consumer goods, the, the delta between the old price and the new price is your insurance premium for a more reliable system. And also, there's a big national security component to this. And I talk about Russia and Ukraine and China in the book. So that's all. Uh, so, so the, uh, the the how the supply you know what the supply chain breakdown means. Chapter one, chapter two, what caused it, and we talked to, about that. And three, where is it going? 
Uh, what are the constraints? And we talked about that. But then my editor, who's love working with us, she said, well, Jim, we've got to be a chapter, a chapter on inflation. I said, of course we do. You know, the supply chain breakdown is causing a lot of the inflation we see. And we agreed on that. And then I said, I'm, and I'm going to write another chapter on deflation. And everyone's like, wait a second. Why are you talking about deflation? That's coming next. People are not ready for it. I know the inflation's here. I buy gasoline. I, I shop in the grocery store. I get it. I'm not, it it's, and it's persistent. It's not transitory. I understand all that. But inflation has two major sources. One is the supply side, which is called cost push inflation. So that's energy price shocks, you know, the stuff we're seeing coming out of Ukraine, fertilizer shortages, strategic metal shortages, um, uh, you know, component suppliers who can't deliver stuff to factories in Germany and they're shutting down, et cetera. The other cause is from the demand side, and that's called demand pull inflation, basically psychological. Consumers pull demand forward. They're like, hey, I was thinking of buying a refrigerator. I better buy it today because the price is going to go up in six months. And the 70s, we had both. It started with cost push with the Arab oil embargo, but it ended up demand pull. Um, I was starting my career at the time. They, Your boss would just give you a raise. You didn't even have to ask. You know, inflation was gone up so fast. Like, I better give this guy a raise. It gives another, you know, 30,000 bucks or whatever, because people would quit, you know. And, uh, and, that, and that sort of spun out of control until Volcker squashed it all. Right now, we do not have... Uh, demand pull inflation. We don't. This, this is not what's going on. We do have cost push inflation. The difference is, is hugely important because cost push inflation <clears throat> from the supply side, which is, again, when I talk about in the book, it's real, prices go up, but uh, it's self-negating. You know, the old saying that, you know, the cure for higher oil prices is higher oil prices because when they get too high, people stop driving. They, they, they shut down um, various activities. By the way, if you're unemployed, you're not buying any gasoline because you're not going anywhere. I mean, that's, that's kind of a nasty way of putting it, but that's that's how the cost push inflation, <clears throat> pardon me, tips into a recession and then prices come down. And we saw that in 1974, you know, you had Jerry Ford and Alan Greenspan walking around with their, they had these wind buttons, you know, WIN, which stood for whip inflation now, except we had a recession and prices collapsed. Uh, now it came back uh, by 77 with uh, for, for a lot of reasons, but but right now we don't have demand pull, we have cost push. It will go away when this economy goes into recession. And then we're going to be talking about um, disinflation and deflation, which are, you know, kind of close cousins. And the Fed's going to be out on a limb as usual, raising rates in the face of a, a recession and a price collapse. Ah, and Jim, that's such a great point. It's one I've actually been engaged in conversation with on, on the recent past videos we've had on this channel, which is, um, uh, I'll go back to, to conversation I had with Lacey Hunt last, where Lacey Hunt's been a big deflationist for a long time, as you know well. In my last conversation with him at, at Wealthion's uh, recent um, it's, uh, September conference, um, Lacey basically said, hey, look, Fed's doing what it has to do. It's got to actually prioritize killing inflation now that inflation's here. Um, and, uh, you know, talked about the, the the primacy of that being priority number one, two, and three right now for the Fed. Um, and then I asked him, I said, well, Lacey, you know, I've been talking to you for years, and you've been telling us that we have this massive deflationary dragon to slay, and you don't really see how we're going to do that well. And that's why you're raising these warning bells. It's a big, big issue. But you're now saying there's this inflation dragon that's shown up. And so we got to focus all our attention on killing it. Hopefully we will. Sounds like you're pretty sanguine in the in the, the sense that like, hey, recession and other factors are probably going to bring inflation down organically here at some point. But even if we manage to do that successfully, we then still have this massive big inflation dragon to deal with. <laughs> and it sounds like you're saying, hey, well, even though we're all focused on inflation right now, the bigger bad in the story is the deflation one. Well, I, yeah, I agree with that. First of all, I, I agree with uh, Lacey's analysis. Our interview with Jim will continue over in part two, which will be released on this channel tomorrow as soon as we're finished editing it. To be notified when it comes out, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already by clicking on the subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. And be sure to hit the like button too while you're down there. And remember, we're continuing our practice of publishing my top takeaways from these weekly interviews. To get mine from this interview with Jim for free, just go to Wealthion.com slash Adam's Notes. 
And finally, if the challenging macro outlook that Jim has detailed in this interview has you feeling a little vulnerable about the prospects for your wealth, then consider scheduling a free, no strings attached portfolio review by a financial advisor who can help manage your wealth, keeping in mind the trends and risks that Jim has mentioned here. Just go to Wealthion.com and we'll help set one up for you. Okay, I'll see you next in part two of our interview with Jim Rickards. Thank you.